in my heart, I will pray. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 William Levi Dawson Institute for Classical and Folk Music Lecture. I am honored to present to you my colleague, my mentor, my friend, uh, Dr. James Abington. And I don't normally uh, read an entire bio, but as I said to him earlier, this is worth reading. And it's, it's short. Uh, so here we go. Born in Gary, uh, West Virginia, Abington received his musical education at Morehouse College, uh, Bachelor of Arts and the University of Michigan, Master of Music and Doctor of Musical Arts. He is currently Associate Professor of Church Music and Worship at Candler School of Theology, Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and Adjunct Professor of Church Music at Morehouse College in Atlanta. He was recently reappointed National Director of Music for the Progressive National Baptist Convention Incorporated and has been the Executive Editor of the African American Church Music Series published by GIA Publications in Chicago for over 20 years. Dr. Abington is a member of the historic Friendship Baptist Church in Atlanta, where he is the Director of Music Ministries and Church Organist. Abington was chair of the core committee for the historic One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism, an African-American ecumenical hymnal released in 2018, with, which consisted of music directors from the African Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, Church of God in Christ, Black Episcopalian Church, United Church of Christ Congregational, Disciples of Christ Christian Church, and Seventh-day Adventists. He is the author of numerous articles and publications, including Let the Church Sing On, Reflections on Black Sacred Music, Readings in African American Church Music and Worship, Volumes 1 and 2, and King of Kings, Organ Music of Black Composers, Past and Present, Volumes 1 through 4, and Let Mount Zion Rejoice, Music of the African American Church. In 2015, Abington was honored by the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada by being named a Fellow of the Hymn Society. This award, the highest honor given by the organization, was conferred because of Abington's work as a scholar, editor, and practitioner of church music, with a particular emphasis on African American congregational song. He is only the second Black scholar to receive this honor, and he follows none other than Harry T. Burley, pioneer of the arranged and concert Negro spiritual, who received this honor in 1944. So congratulations to you, Dr. Abington. Uh, speaking of his friend and colleague, Robert Battistini, who was a retired vice president and senior editor of GIA Publications remarked, in the very DNA of Dr. Abington, one would find a compelling devotion for the music of the church and a compelling passion for being an instrument of that song endless praise for our God. And I can only second that. Uh, Dr. Abington is in constant demand as an organist, lecturer, clinician, choral conductor, consultant, and scholar. And Dr. Abington, I want to add my own personal note uh, uh, to this introduction. Uh, you and I met while I was a graduate student <laughs> at Southern Methodist University. Dr. Abington uh, invited me to join the staff at Hartford Memorial Baptist Church uh, in Detroit, Michigan, where he was Minister of Music. He also introduced me to the faculty at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where we crossed the stage together, yes. Abington <laughs> and then Barr, uh, when we earned our doctorates. And he has been a mentor and a big brother to me. Uh, he has a hand in my being here at Tuskegee. Uh, since he brought this opening to my attention. So Dr. Abington, I am grateful to you on so many levels. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm pleased to have you, we are pleased to have you as our 2022 Dawson lecturer to speak on the topic, Charles Albert Tinley in the 21st century, hymns for our time. 
Dr. Abington. Thank you so much, my friend and colleague, Dr. Barr. I think you're the only one that get by with that and the way you did. And as I listened to it, it didn't so much sound like my obituary, but thank you so much. Uh, I am humbled and honored to have been invited to give this distinguished lecture in the name of William L. Dawson by my friend and colleague, Dr. Barr, who is Director of Choral Activities and Interim Chair of the Department of Fine Arts and Fine and Performing Arts there at Tuskegee University. It is for me a crown placed above my head that I shall spend the rest of my life growing tall enough to wear. Thank you. My greatest regret, as you know, is that I am unable to be there in person, as this would have been my first time being on the campus of Tuskegee University. I know many very distinguished and proud alum of the university and look forward to the day when I can actually walk the grounds where William Dawson walked and worked. I'm privileged for I recall immediately my several experiences of meeting Mr. Dawson. He was certainly a very outstanding and unique figure in the history and development of music of Black Americans. I recall on one occasion, and Wayne, you can really appreciate this. I was at the University of Michigan and I was working on some assignment and decided I would take the nerve to call Mr. Dawson, whose number at that time was listed in the phone directory, which you don't uh, find that these days. But I actually found Mr. Dawson's telephone number and called him up and he answered the phone. And I was hoping that he would give me an interview. And he said, oh, I don't do interviews, don't do interviews. Don't do interviews. What, 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 what you wanna know about? And so I began to tell him that I was interested in the spiritual and what I was, how, how do you define the spiritual? How do you define the spiritual? So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm on here with William Dawson and I'm trying to reach for a book, literally reaching for a book, uh, the Groves, New Groves Dictionary of Music. And he said, don't be looking for no books as if he were looking for me from down above, you know, like the wizard in the Wizard of Oz. And so I started trying to be profound and come up with, an answer that I thought he might like. And he said, oh, too many words, too many words. That's, that's the more words you use, the less you're saying. And so I said, okay. He said, well, they're simply folk songs. They're religious folk songs by black folks. And that short definition opened a new understanding and appreciation for his work and for the spiritual and all that followed the spiritual that were, that were gifts of unknown bards, black and unknown bards, as James Weldon Johnson said. So I am delighted to share those things with you. All this topic, Charles Albert Tinley in the 21st century, hymns of our time. I asked, did we have just an hour or a semester? So since I know it's an hour and probably I've used up five minutes of that, I wanna jump right into this because this is a topic that I think is timeless, uh, and particularly Charles Albert Tinley of all people. In a culture dominated by entertainment, hyped up immediacy, feeling, manipulated desire, forgetfulness of being, political chaos and corruption, domestic and global terrorism, COVID-19 and its variants, wars and rumors of wars. Can we still hope for rich hymnody in the black church? In many of our black churches, these musical treasures, biblically based, theologically sound and culturally relevant treasures have either been completely eliminated or on ventilators breathing their last breath. Pastors and music leaders must be able to discern and distinguish worship from entertainment, spirituality from emotionalism, 
sanctified substance from self-constructed and self-serving agendas for a desired response. Prophetic proclamation from popular and pleasing preaching, theological truth from fatigued and tuckered out traditionalism. These are issues in the church that many times go unaddressed because they're swept under the robe of God is doing a new thing and we wanna throw all of those things out. You've heard the expression, we don't wanna throw the baby out with uh, the bath water. But in some cases, as it relates to the hymnody and the rich hymnody of African-Americans and the rich history that goes back to late 17th, early 18th, uh, 19th century for something that I'm not quite sure really does what the hymn has done in the church. My friend, Aubrey Hendricks, and great scholar, in an article called, I am the holy dope dealer, problems with gospel music today. He says, and I must read extensively from this. Nat Turner and Fannie Lou, Famer, Lou, Lou uh, Hamer must be turning in their miry graves. Today, the prophetic consciousness that with head and heart once told black people to, to resist the white supremacist oppression that bedeviled their every step no longer informs the music that once inspired us to action. Although white skinned colored preference remained the creed of this nation, today the prophets call for let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream is seldom voiced in black sacred songs. Songs that once moved the fighting 54th of Massachusetts to brave death for glory. Songs that emboldened Fannie Lou Hamer to proclaim to the forces of J. Edgar Hoover and the KKK that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Songs that help us to brave Bull Connor's vicious beatings with our eyes stayed on freedom, even as our daughters lie bombed in our churches and our sons lie lynched on our yards. Black sacred music had this power because it took pains to remind us that Pharaoh's army got drowned to remind us that didn't God, didn't the Lord deliver Daniel? And if so, why not everyone? To remind us that against all odds, Joshua and his poor band of Hebrew outcasts fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. It gave us songs of comforting Jesus, yes, but also songs of the warrior. Jesus, songs that help us to stand boldly and unbowed before the most effective engines of oppression and dehumanization ever conceived to declare, right on King Jesus, no man can a hinder me. Songs of hope and love and resistance and change. Songs that reminded us long before Einstein drew breath that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice on earth as it is in heaven. Hendrick prophetically proclaims, despite the empowering nature of black sacred music of the past, in the dominant mode of black religious music today, contemporary gospel music, I would add praise and worship music, this prophetic voice, this resistant voice, this biblical logic of justice is all but stilled. Gospel music is heard everywhere today. Yet unlike the spirituals, 
It does not press our suits for freedom. It does not call like the spiritual did for Moses to go way down in Egypt's land and tell my people to let, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. It is this wonderful, wonderful critique and challenge of Dr. Aubrey Hendricks that makes this topic even more important as we look at and to begin to investigate the life of this man, Charles Albert Tinley. You may not know the name Charles Albert Tinley, but perhaps you have sung some of his hymns, Nothing Between, My Soul and the Savior, or When the Storms of Life Are Raging, Stand By Me, or Take Your Burden to the Lord and Leave It There, or Beams of Heaven As I Go, or Someday, and certainly probably his most popular, will understand it better by and by. Charles Albert Tindley, orator, poet, writer, theologian, pastor, and social activist, was born in 1851 in Berlin, Winchester County, Maryland, and died in 1933 in Philadelphia. The dash between those years was most significant and remarkable. This giant was called the Prince of Preachers, the father of African-American hymnody, and progenitor of Black gospel music. During his life, he made an indelible imprint among Methodism, historic trail, and was a most influential and dynamic cleric in American religious and social history. He is one of Methodism's eminent preachers, but unfortunately, very little has been written about him or is known about him outside of the few hymns that represent less than one quarter of his output. Without a doubt, he ranks as one of the most effective preachers ever produced by Methodism in general and Black Methodism in particular. Carter G. Woodson said that Tinley and C.T. Walker were the two greatest preachers of power developed during the second generation of freedom. Between 1880 and 1895, Tinley was a member of the Bainbridge Street Methodist Episcopal Church of Philadelphia where he served as janitor. This congregation granted him license to preach and, a, and enabled him to become a member of the Delaware Annual Conference. In 1902, he was refused reappointment as presiding elder. Those now holding this position uh, are termed the district superintendent. Of the Salisbury district and asked for assignment to Brainsbridge Street Methodist Episcopal Church. Tinley's request was reluctantly granted by the bishop for Tinley had brought a new dimension to presiding eldership by having rendered statistical reports and personal evaluations of ministers he supervised. I must add that when Tinley arrived at the church, it was the brain Bridge Street Methodist Episcopal Church, and the name was later changed to the East Calvary Methodist Episcopal Church. And in 1927, a membership of nearly 10,000 people changed its name to the Tinley Temple United Methodist Church, and it remains the same today. His arrival at Bainbridge Street was not universally accepted by the congregation for several prominent officials and lay persons remembered him as the tall ganglion man from Berlin, Maryland, who over 10 years before had taught himself how to read and write while being the unpaid sexton of their place of worship. 
Others pointed out that he had never attended any school or college or seminary as had their previous ministers. In Timothy's book of sermons, he describes his struggle to learn to read and comments on how this expression affected him. It therefore became my lot to be hired out wherever father could place me. The people with whom I lived were not all good. Some of them were very cruel to me. I was not permitted to have a book or go to church. I used to find bits of newspaper on the roadside and put them in my bosom for I had no pockets in order to study the ABCs from them. During the day, I would gather pine knots, and when the people were asleep at night, I would light those pine knots and lying flat on my stomach to permit from being seen by anyone who might still be about, would with fire coals mark all the words I could make out on these bits of newspaper. I continued in this way and without any teacher, could I, could, uh, until I could learn to read the Bible almost without stopping to spell the words. For more than 18 years of this uh, passing of his learning to read and to write, he garnered enough information to take the examination for ministry. And when he moved to Philadelphia in his youth, three years having been a hard carrier in Philadelphia and attending school at night, he said, I made a rule to learn at least one new thing, a thing I did not know the day before, each day. This rule was faithfully pursued throughout his life. As a self-taught person, Tinley did not graduate from a recognized college or seminary. Although he was an avid reader and accumulated more than 8,000 volumes in his library, which incidentally are located in the current Tinley Temple United Methodist Church in Philadelphia. The best information on this comes from the words of Tinley. Many people have asked me about my education and how I secured it. I wish I could tell all the ways and means employed for this purpose, for the sake of encouraging some boy and girl who may be as poor and unfortunate as I was. My first plan was to buy every book I could, which I thought contained anything that I should know. Then I entered by correspondence all the schools which my limited means would afford and sought to keep up with the studies with any pupil who studied in the schoolroom. I was able to attend Brandywine Institute and to finish its theological course. By correspondence, I took the Greek course through the Boston Theological School and Hebrew under Professor Speaker through the Hebrew Synagogue on North Broad Street in Philadelphia. I took my studies in science and literature as a private student because I was unable to attend the universities where these subjects were taught. Thus, while I was unable to go through schools, I was able to let the schools go through me. I have picked my way up the hillside of learning and kept the fires of education burning. And by the gleams of scholarly light, I worked all day and studied all night. I measure not my tasks by age, nor pick out others to be my gauge. My life has only begun. My sun is in, my gold is in the sun. His poetic voice can be heard even in that statement. Bennett College, Greensboro, North Carolina, and Morgan State University, it is now in Baltimore, Maryland, 
gave me, gave Tinley the degree of Doctor of, of Divinity some years ago. He says, but before that, God had given me a real call to the ministry and the gift of the Holy Ghost. He has recorded that his church grew and became one of the largest and most influential in Philadelphia in the 1920s. As I said, with a membership of nearly 10,000, with many ministries and outreach programs in the community and throughout the city. This is an interesting point. During his pastorate in Philadelphia, there were numerous acts of violence against African-Americans. In 1911, there occurred the horrific lynching of Zachariah Walker of Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which precipitated the NAACP's launching of a nationwide protest against lynching. Though thousands of Blacks migrated to Philadelphia from the South toward the 19th and early 20th century with the hope of a new beginning, they faced racial discrimination in many facets of society, particularly in education, employment, and housing. Tinley pastored during World War I and the 1918 flu epidemic that killed over a hundred million people globally and 650,000 in the United States. And in the great, during the Great Depression from August, 1929 to March, 1933, the year he died. Isn't that an ironic and parallel situation of the times? And therefore, when you look at the hymnody of Tinley, it says a lot about what he felt was urgent to preach about. And he was unique in that as he preached about these things, he created songs that would also accompany these kinds of situations. His most popular, his most famous, I should say, sermon is entitled Heaven's Christmas Tree, which can be found in a wonderful anthology entitled Preaching with Sacred Fire, an, an, an anthology of African-American sermons, 1750 to the present, edited by Martha Simmons and Frank A. Thomas. During his life, this sermon was demanded year after year. The text of his sermon was Revelation 22, 2. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was the tree of life. The sermon became so popular that the church had to rent the Olympian Boxing Hall, a 5,000 capacity seat arena for him to deliver this famous sermon. Olympic Arena proved too small to accommodate the many worshipers and curious non-believers. After the sermon, Tinley invited all who were unchurched to come to the altar for prayer. More than 100 responded and slightly over 50 applied for membership. The second time Tinley delivered his Heaven's Christmas Tree Sermon in the Olympic arena, all seats were occupied, but not as many people were turned away as formerly. He expressed himself as disappointed when worship was completed. He was asked why. His response was, I need a proper hymn for that sermon. He replied, next year I'll have one, and he did. Listen to that hymn shortly. That does not appear, however, in the United Methodist Hymnal, but I am delighted to say that it now appears in the African American Heritage Hymnal and in the most recently appointed hymnal, One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism, an African American Ecumenical Hymn. And it can be found 
uh, also in the Songs of Zion hymn, hymnal. But what is so important about this hymn is that you really must know the sermon. The sermon is unique in that Tinley sees the branches of the tree from this Revelation 22, verse 2, for the healing of the nation. The limbs of the Christmas tree are very important. And these limbs are hope for the hopeless, forgiveness for the guilty, help for the weak, friendship for the friendless, peace for the troubled, and home for the homeless. Wow, what a hymn for our times. Let's listen now to Charles Albert Tinley's hymn, Heaven's Christmas Tree, which was written two years after the sermon.
that hymn is so popular, particularly in the Northeast. As people say, we must sing Silent Night, they say we must sing Heaven's Christmas Tree. And again, think about that. Hope for the hopeless, forgiveness for the guilty, help for the weak, friendship for the friendless, peace for the troubled, and a home for the homeless. This is not unusual of Tinley. In fact, we find this kind of hymnody throughout his lifetime. Tinley is a great hymn writer and a lyrical theologian, I would add. Though very curiously summarized, this examination of his hymnic output can be also evaluated in how he understands imagery, his figures of speech, his vocabulary, which involves the poor and marginalized, which readily identifies justice, beggars, the poor, distressed, the destitute, trials, tribulations, storms of life, fears, persecution, forsakenness, oppressed, burdens, misery, troubles, disappointments, despised, prisoners, bondmen, starvation, victims, the world as a battlefield, and comfort denied to all. These are just some of the words that you find embedded in Tinley's hymnody. I'm always excited to introduce one of Tinley's hymns that unfortunately didn't make it in the United Methodist hymnal, didn't make it in some of the other collections. In fact, the only place that this hymn can be found again is in the One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism hymnal, which is entitled, A Better Day is Coming. Tinley certainly moves to the eschatological or the hope for the world, or what is to come, going over to the other side. We see this in so much of his hymnal. Or comfort, take your burdens to the Lord and leave it, stand by me. Tinley was a social activist. He was a man who believed in the freedom and equality. Most recently, I was sent a copy of an address that he gave on January the 1st, 1922, looking at emancipation, proclamation, and what was supposedly the freedom of Black folk. And Tinley stood flat-footed and he broke that down in a way that a politician and a minister could only do. But listen to this text that you probably have not heard by Tim. A better day is coming. The morning draweth nigh. When girded right with holy might shall overthrow the wrong. When Christ our Lord shall listen to every plaintiff sigh and stretch o'er every land in justice by and by. Listen to what he does in the second stanza. The boast of haughty error no more shall fill the land while men enraged their powers engaged to kill their fellow man. But God the Lord shall triumph and Satan's host shall flee. For wrong must cease and righteousness shall conquer by and by. In his third stanza, he gets even deeper. No more will angry nations in deadly conflict meet. While children cry and parents die in conflict or defeat. For Jesus Christ, the captain, will give the battle cry. The Holy Ghost will lead the host to victory by and by. My, my, you would think Henley, Tinley just wrote this song this month, 
as we look across our world and see the kinds of injustices that are going on. He's not through. No more will angry nations in deadly conflicts meet. Well, he goes on to that, but he's so the fourth stanza. No more shall lords and rulers their helpless victims press and bar the door against the poor and leave them in distress. But God, the King of glory, who hears the ravens cry, will give command to every man, have plenty by and by. The refrain says, tis coming by and by, tis coming by and by. A better day is coming, the morning draweth nigh. Tis coming by and by, tis coming by and by. The welcome dawn is hastening on. Tis coming by and by. Let's listen to this. Albert Tinley, as we have noted, was an early hymn writer of the 20th century. Many of his hymns we have never heard as the one we just heard. And then there are a couple that come to mind that we have heard in more gospel style. The first of which is one that I loved and heard my grandfather and the saints back in Gary, West Virginia say, the storm is passing over. However, now I didn't hear it sung like the version you're about to hear now that is most popular. And people will say Charles Albert Tinley. Well, it is Charles Albert Tinley's uh, text. Somehow, what should I say? adapted from the first stanza. 
But I want you to listen to how Tinley works out this whole idea of the storm and being on the ocean. In what is a four stanza hymn, not just one. Now, it's interesting when you hear the recording, uh, we hear, take courage, my soul, and let us journey on. I've heard people say, encourage my soul. But when you look at the original text of Tinley, it simply says, courage, my soul, and let us journey on. Though the night is dark, it won't be very long. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears and the storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Second stanza. Billows rolling high and thunder shakes the ground. Lightning flash and tempest all around. Jesus walks the sea and calms the angry waves and the storm is passing over, hallelujah. The third stanza, the stars have disappeared and distant lights are dim. My soul is filled with fears, the seas are breaking in. The master cry, be not afraid, tis I, and the storm will soon be over. Hallelujah. The final stanza. Soon we shall reach the distant shining shore. Free from all the storms, we'll rest forevermore. Safe within the veil, we furred the riven sail, and the storms will all be over. Hallelujah. And the refrain simply says, hallelujah, hallelujah, the storm is passing over, hallelujah. Let's listen to an arrangement, a gospel arrangement made popular by the late Donald Vail and the Donald Vail Corlears. This is an arrangement of some former students who did this recording from Morgan State University and alum. But listen to this, uh, Charles Albert Tinley, uh, setting of the first stanza and refrain of his hymn, The Storm is Passing Over.
recall from my childhood hearing the seasoned saints of the church sing that song, and then they would couple that with there's a storm out on the ocean and it's moving this away. If you are not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Oh, drift away, Lord, drift away. You will surely drift away. If you are not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Constantly revisits the storm, the, the tempest, the, 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 the uh, oppressions. He understood political oppression, economic recession, lying obsession, and now voter suppression. But he still worked hard in his ministry, in his sermons, and reflected in his songs. One that many of you will know is when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. And he goes on in that to talk about the storms being like a tossing sea, a ship upon the sea. But thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. He goes on to talk about in the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assails and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. He repeats that twice because he knows we do have a lot of faults and failures. He says, when I do the best I can and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in battle array, undertake to stop my way. Thou who saved Paul and Silas, stand by me. And he always seemed in his hymnody to look toward that heavenly or that heavenward or that eschatological group, uh, view. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden, and I'm nearing chilly Jordan. O thou lily of the valley, stand by me. We have heard many different arrangements and we've heard a whole lot of, of, of variations, I should say, on that whole idea of stand by me. I mentioned the hymn that you just heard, Storm, uh, the storm uh, is passing over. And I thought immediately of another hymn that we hear sung today, which comes from probably my favorite of his text, Beams of Heaven As I Go, Someday. It is another hymn of eschatological hope or of the otherworldliness, the end of world, end times, the second coming of Christ that reminds us that life is filled with burdens disappointments, wickedness, trouble, and sorrow, but there is hope. A close examination of Tinley's text seems to speak directly to our current times. They are speaking to us in the 21st century. This arrangement that you are about to hear is a gospel arrangement by the late Robert uh, Wooten, from Chicago, Illinois, who was the director of the Robert Wooten Chorale. And they were known for ending all of their concerts with this arrangement of Beams of Heaven As I Go. I just want to share the text because what you hear in his arrangement, again, is only the first stanza and a little bit of the chorus of this. But I want you to listen to Tenley's poetry. Beams of heaven as I go through this wilderness below. Guide my feet in peaceful ways. Turn my midnights into days. When in the darkness I would grope, faith always sees a star of hope. And soon from all life's grief and danger, 
I shall be free someday. The second stanza is often times uh, may skies as my skies are clear, joys abound without a tear. Though a day so bright be gone, clouds may hide tomorrow's sun. There'll be a day that's always bright, a day that never yields to night. And in its lights, the street of glory, I shall behold someday. Third stanza, harder yet may be the fight. Right may often yield to might. Wickedness a while may reign. Satan's cause may seem to gain. But there is a God that rules above with hand of power and heart of love. If I am right, he'll fight my battle. I shall have peace someday. In his final stanza, he says, burdens now may crush me down. Disappointments all around. Troubles speak in mournful sigh. Sorrow through a tear-stained eye. But there is a world where pleasure reigns. No morning soul shall roam its plain, but to and to that land of peace and glory, I want to go someday. And that powerful chorus says, I do not know how long twill be, or what the future holds for me. But this I know, if Jesus leads me. I shall get home someday. Let's listen to the Robert Wooten gospel arrangement of Tenley's hymn, Beams of Heaven.
Dr. Barr, or better known to me, Wayne, as I listen to that and think of that text, we must remember our former boss, pastor, and, and Harvard Hooper, Charles Adams. One of the things you had to learn quickly in your repertoire at Hartford Church was how to play Beams of Heaven. And certainly for me, no one could sing it quite like him. As I begin to bring this lecture on Charles Albert Chinley and the 21st century, the hymns of our times, we're looking at hymns written long before our time, but oh, how they speak to us right now. It was John W. Work of Fisk University that talked about gospel, and the coming of gospel music, particularly in his uh, 1961 address to the International Hymnological Society that was meeting in New York City. And his statement was that the gospel music of the time is, in his estimation, becoming the new spiritual. I love that statement and I love coupling that with what Dr. Aubrey Hendrick said, that extensive excerpt that I read from him. And the challenge to hymn writers, and to hymn poets, I like hymns of first poetry before they are set to music. But to think of the times and to look at the situations and write hymns that are relevant to the people and that challenges us and that lifts us up, that glorifies God, that looks at the community, that somehow embodies what it really means to be Christian in the 21st century. And to be able to do it in a way that the spiritual did for enslaved Africans in America. And many of those spirituals are today, many set by Jamel Dawson, still find resonance today. I think of his famous bomb in Gilead, and the wonderful analysis or reflection on that by uh, Howard Thurman when he said the Jeremiah 822 question, is there a bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Is there no doctor there? He says the question mark is turned into an exclamation point in that spiritual to resound and to be confident there is, there is a bomb in Gilead. We need that kind of prophetic voice speaking in our hymns today that speak to the time and that really enliven and enrich and helps to form us as Christians. I think the best hymns for our times should be formational. They should be formative. They should be transformative. They should be cognitive. They should teach us something. They should be educational for sure and inspirational. Now, I can't add to that list entertaining and fun because that is not the purpose in church to entertain. We have our venues and our outlets for that. But in our encounter with God and coming before God's presence, our hymnody should be that of the times and it should be that that is going to reflect in us what many times we may not be able to articulate for ourselves, but many times the stanzas of hymns will do it for us. There is nothing more clear than Charles Albert Tinley's most famous of his hymns. In Psalm 137, the Babylonians have carried the Jews captive from their own land as they yearn for Jerusalem. To complete their woes, they insult them over and over again. They require of them a song. This was very barbarous, also profane, for no song would serve but the songs of Zion. But in all of our oppression and all of our woes and all of our takeovers, text encourages us and says, we are tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. 
somber skies and howling tempests oft succeeds a bright sunshine. In that land of perfect day, when the mists have rolled away, we'll understand it better by and by. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to the blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye and we'll follow till we die, for we'll understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. Finally, in that very, very well-known chorus, he says, by and by when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathered home. We will tell the story of how we've overcome for we'll understand it better by and by. That's a hope that Tinley leaves us with through so many of the things and the oppressions and the aforementioned uh, struggles and challenges that we understand. We are trying to understand it. We do not understand it. But Tinley tells us to hold on. We will understand it by and by. One of my former colleagues at Emory said one time after we were considering I think it was a devastating earthquake in Haiti. And we were praying that morning and I said, Bishop, how much more can these people take? He says, Jimmy, I don't know. He says, but I have a, what I call or what I have labeled as my, I just don't understand closet. And there are situations like this that I just place in my closet of I just don't understand why. He said, but when I see Jesus, I hope to open the door of that closet and ask God to explain some of these things because I just don't understand why. But I do believe that by and by, I'll understand something that is much, much too infinite for me to understand, but I will hope that I will understand it better by and by. Let's listen to this hymn as we begin to close this lecture.
again, I want to thank you, Dr. Barr and Tuskegee University for this invitation to come by this virtual means to deliver the William L. Dawson lecture. As I prepared for this and I was thinking about Tinley, I could not help but realize that Tinley certainly would have been a very influential person during the life of William Dawson and that he certainly would have been exposed to his hymnody. And there are so many connections between what Dawson did in terms of his music through the spiritual that edified the church and continues to edify the church and the community and the academy and the world, as is true with Charles Albert Tinley, who lived from 1851 to 1933. And here we are in 2022, celebrating this man in the 21st century and the hymns that he wrote at that time being so relevant to us today. I appreciate the fact that you have paused and made this time available and commend you to keep on keeping on. Thank you so much, Dr. Barr. Thank you, Dr. Abington. And this has been a thank you for this uh, comprehensive uh, discussion uh, on Charles Albert Tindy and his influence, uh, not only in the world of hymnody, but uh, across the, the social justice spectrum. And I just want to make a, another plug for your two volumes, Reading in African American Church Music and Worship. Uh, these two compilations uh, bring together a lot of the writings, a lot of the articles uh, that pertain to African American church music and worship. And um, uh, they're almost akin to Eileen Southern's uh, uh, books, you know, her um, uh, African American music, reading in African American music. This is, I put that right on the shelf next to them. So if yeah. you have not, if you do not have these, uh, by all means, uh, go out and get a copy. Available from GIA. Okay. And now I, I want to begin by asking um, Charles Albert Tinley's hymns. How do they line up with uh, other writers? You mentioned Char uh, Charles Wesley or even uh, Fanny Crosby. There's a, there's a certain structure in writing hymns. Uh, does he follow those that uh, prescribed Absolutely. structure? <laughs> Absolutely. That's an excellent question and thank you for it. Uh, we, we identify the year 1850 uh, in hymnology as the beginning of the gospel song era. Uh, looking back at composers like uh, Philip Bliss and uh, uh, Sankey and uh, so many others that were writing at that time, certainly Fanny Crosby who comes around and this whole idea of stanza and refrain of stanza and chorus. And this is, this is found in many of Charles Albert uh, Tinley's hymns. Um, I think of very few, uh, and you would have to look at a wonderful collection uh, that was done by the publishing board of the United Methodist Church. It's entitled Beams of Heaven by Charles Albert Tinley. And I, what I love about it is that it actually contains the hymns that were actually written by Tinley only, which means in terms of the hymns that are in print, that hymn that Tinley wrote that are in print, there are only 46, and that is important to know, but uh, it's a wonderful collection. And again, this is available through the uh, general uh, publishing board of the General Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. Uh, this came out in like 2007, but it, it has the wonderful, wonderful text. And I strongly encourage to this, uh, to this lecture that that collection be uh, attached because you will see and learn more about Tinley than you will ever see in hymnals. But yes, it definitely reflects his understanding and his use of kind of the style of hymns at that time uh, and the, the kind of the form, the gospel song of, 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 of texts, of uh, his, the texts that were 
uh, rendered in multiple stanzas and with a refrain. Some of them did not have refrains, but certainly the multiple stanza was very popular. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because as I began to uh, put Charles Albert Tinley into context with other Black hymn writers that we don't know, uh, names like Richard Allen, Daniel Payne, James Weldon Randolph, not James Weldon Johnson, James Weldon Randolph, uh, Thomas Myers Decatur Ward, Joshua Mc, uh, Carter Simpson, Charles Price Jones, a major hymn writer whose hymns uh, far exceed all of the Black hymn writers that we know today in that denomination of the Church of Christ Holiness USA founded in Jackson, Mississippi. His hymn, which a book called His Fullness Songs was published in 1977. And in that hymnal, there are at least 475 hymns that have been written by Charles Price Jones. And uh, they certainly model the period and the times that he was, that he was writing with both uh, with stanzas and refrains. Uh, he arranged several spirituals. Uh, he wrote anthems as well. Uh, some of his most popular hymns that people may know are deeper, deeper. Uh, I will make the darkness light come unto me. Um, oh, there's another, uh, when, uh, oh, where shall I be when the first trumpet sounds? There are several, just tons of hymns. That's another lecture, but he is certainly a neglected yes. hymn writer. But even looking at the hymns of, of uh, F.M. Uh, Hamilton and uh, coming on down with the Holiness Pentecostal hymn writers, which I am uh, working on a manuscript right now of looking at uh, G.T. Haywood, and Robert C. Lawson, uh, S. Catherine Grimes. All of these folk are kind of in the, uh, in the background, but they were prolific and very profound hymn writers, uh, prophetic, I should add, too, uh, to the hymn names that are more popular, like Lucy Campbell, Thomas A. Dorsey, Doris Akers, Roberta Martin, Kenneth Morris, Albert Goodson, Herbert Brewster, uh, and then of course of later years, Andre Crouch, Richard Smallwood. I would certainly add to that list, Margaret Pleasant Duro, uh, and so many others. But they uh, certainly, uh, Tindley was very much influenced by that time. And I think a lot of generations following him. However, we don't find a lot of hymn writers, I'll say black hymn writers today that are using that kind of, uh, they may use the AB form, the kind of the binary form, but it is not the kind of multiple stanza where we expect congregations to sing. Uh, we, we put a, what we call a psalmist or a solo or whatever, and they sing all the verses and the people just come in on a chorus which uh, really loses so much of the real uh, message uh, in, in the, the, the text. Yeah. Wow, well, you touched on several, <laughs> several questions that I had. Um, I was gonna ask about some of our contemporary hymn writers mm -hmm. and you mentioned some of those, but uh, okay. You mentioned Richard Smallwood uh, and uh, Andre Crouch, mm -hmm. okay, and I guess I, I would consider those uh, gospel music composers, and and they are. But yes, <laughs> uh, I guess my question is, how do uh, when does when does a gospel song become a hymn? Great question, Professor. <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that I teach or try to free up my students. Uh, in my introduction to worship classes is to understand two words that they've probably heard but have misunderstandings of them. And it is hymn and anthem. When you say anthem, people immediately, you know, freeze, you know, or put, get grabbed for a cross to put up in front, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but what they don't understand about the word anthem is that it simply means a selection, a song, sacred poetry based on the from the Bible text, whatever, through chorus, genres or style. But here comes the real definition, sung exclusively by the choir. It is a piece sung exclusively by the choir. The congregation does not join in on the morning anthem. Now they may know it and sing along with it. But trust me, if you're doing 
you know, a, a, a Brahms, the congregations that are going to turn around and join you and how lovely is that dwelling place? Right. Although some churches may be, well, perhaps years ago they would have or could have. But that's, that's, the, that's the difference. On the other hand, the hymn is the sacred poem set to music and intended for use by the congregation. It's everybody's song. Now, Here's where that, that uh, you have to understand. You think of arrangements like When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, that wonderful uh, Martin, uh, Gilbert Martin arrangement. It was first a hymn, but Martin uh, made that arrangement for choir. So it became what we call a hymn anthem or hymn arrangement in that while they may know the text and they will know the melody, it was not intended to be sung by the congregation. Or you think of several pieces, like you remember the Nancy Worst arrangement of Blessed Assurance, or Mac Wilbur's moving uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And we could think of many, many hymns, but they have been arranged for choirs. That's different from the actual hymn that was intended to be sung by the congregation. Now, I said regardless of genre. So if we start back with uh, plain song, you know, uh, and uh, our, our, our plain chant, uh, you go on to the Lutheran chorale and the Genevan Psalter, and you keep moving down through the uh, the Victorian uh, hymnody and folk songs and the folk traditions and the folk tunes. And then you come over here and you look at the or the carol. You look at the uh, early music of Appalachia, the Southern gospel, the spiritual. Uh, you look at what may become folk tunes that are maybe more. Uh, uh, well, I said Appalachia, but they might be grounded in particular reason, uh, regions. Then you start even getting some tunes that are influenced by jazz. Uh, that's a little later. Or uh, then the other, of course, is gospel music and gospel tunes. But the difference is, if you can imagine, at one time, uh, we probably people don't imagine, Andre Crouch's Soon and Very Soon, was a piece that was recorded by Andre Crouch and the Disciples intended to be sung by a men's group. Well, I call it singing over to the congregation. After the group sings it so long, the whole congregation can sing it. The same was true of the song, The Lord is My Light by I think it's Lillian Boatnighter. Uh, that, was a, that song was recorded up in, uh, what was it? Flint, Michigan, I think some years ago. And people heard the choir and before you know it, the whole congregation sings, The Lord is My Light. The same was true with Richard Smallwood's, uh, total well, Total Praise, you know, it's the same way. And we could go on and on. And so many of the songs by the hymn writers, we've come this far by faith. I love the, the story behind that. It was written by Albert Goodson, kind of a one hit wonder who came from Los Angeles and who was in Chicago and wrote this as the radio choir's theme song for the church that he served at that time. So every week when they came on the radio, We've Come This Far By Faith was the radio choir's theme song. And now how many times have churches sung We've Come This Far By Faith? And we can go on and on and on uh, with, with pieces like that. So uh, when you look at something like the African-American Heritage Hymnal, or you look at Total Praise, or you look at the One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism, you see songs that one time were really never intended to be sung by the congregation. But now we can sing them. Everyone is singing them. Uh, and so when I think of those definitions of the hymn, meaning the song of the congregation, the anthem being the song of the choir, regardless of genre, uh, I remember some years ago, one of my friends in Detroit, uh, the choir had been invited to a white church out in, uh, in the suburbs. And they called his office and said, uh, we would like to print your choir's anthems in the bulletin. And he just tripped out. You know, he's like, oh, 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 we're not doing no anthem. He didn't tell us we had to do anthems. He said, oh, yeah, oh, what, 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 I mean, how, what, what we going to I said, well, no, 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 no. They're not referring to anthems by genres. They want to know what are your choir selection. They want to print the choir's anthems. What is it that the choir is going to sing? He said, well, we're doing gospel. I said, it doesn't have anything to do with the genres. They want to know what is it exclusively that will be sung by your choir. And it was the first time he had wrestled with that word anthem mm -hmm. and heard it used in that, as we will so we say the hymns. Well, what's the hymn going to be? Uh, it may be any style. But I think those are two very important terms to really, in fact, we don't talk, call it hymns. Now, in most institutions, we don't teach right. hymnology. 
we call it congregational song. Maybe psalmody and congregational song. But then after we change the title of the course, we still teach him. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Um, and I guess, you know, this, uh, ooh, many churches are moving away from him. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, at, at you, you alluded to it in your introduction. Um, so now we're, we're kind of, I guess, catering to uh, a certain generation or a certain style or, you know, how can we change things to appeal to the masses? <laughs> um, is, is, is there a, a danger perhaps that gospel music is becoming that filler? And I don't mean that, you know, that in a sense is a bad thing, but is, is gospel becoming the new hymn? Well, it, I, I think, I think uh, Dr. Hendricks so, so accurately alludes to that in terms of what is it that we're singing? I think there are people who really get preoccupied with the style. When we think of a hymn, we're thinking about something that sounds like uh, How Firm a Foundation or Mighty Fortress is Our God or, you know, or I'll Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And we're not talking about the style. We're really talking about, back to my original discussion of the congregational song. What is it that collectively we sing? What we're discovering now, and you mentioned the volumes of uh, uh, readings in African-American church music and worship in the volume two, there is a wonderful uh, essay in there, a uh, chapter actually from her book by Deborah uh, Smith Pollard, who talks about, uh, you know, uh, uh, praise and worship. And she looks at people's uh, evaluations of praise and worship, how it started and what happens and people saying congregations can't always sing the music or they don't know the tunes or the, the, the ranges. And so people are beginning to complain with that genre. But in many cases, after praise and worship, they move on through it. There is a soloist and the congregation rarely sings. In fact, if you look at worship today and ask what are the congregation song, they will invariably re uh, refer to what is being sung during the praise and worship period. But when you ask how often does the congregation, that's all of the people sing, that's almost, I mean, that's, that's what I, I, I said earlier was, uh, it's, uh, it's either been completely eliminated or it's on a ventilator, you know, breathing its last breath because um, it's, it's just not happening in churches. We are replacing choirs for praise teams. So the choirs, as we knew them now, are six and seven, and they all have their, you know, different color mic, anointed and set aside, and they, they don't sing with other people lest they lose their anointment. But uh, so you've got all kind of separatism and division. Uh, I, that, and Deborah talks about that in the article. I think her interview with Carol Cole talks about that kind of this elite and set aside group. But, uh, and I'm not against praise and worship by any means. And I must say, I am not against contemporary gospel music. I'm just always cautious of the biggest word in contemporary. Temporary, T-E-M-P-O-R-A-R-Y. It's temporary. Yes, so that in another month, that hot song is already cold, dead, thrown away. And so yes. what comes after that? But it's amazing to see that our discussion today about Charles Albert Tindley, we're still singing these songs, they still move us. Um, I think what people are really, uh, what they're saying is that we don't know the tunes. Uh, there's a term that came up a few years ago, some more conservative hymn, uh, hymn scholars didn't like it. They called it retuning the hymns, retuning. So in other words, instead of that tune that you've known, they're making more contemporary tunes. They're using the same, they're not touching the text because they say, okay, we, this, this text, we, you know, we're, we're, we're good with this. We can't outdo this, but you know, that melody won't work. So the danger comes if you get a bad melody and there's a bad marriage of tune and text, uh, it's bound to divorce. Yes. Yes. Well, I can go, that goes back to, I guess, uh, the, the foundation of a good hymn. You know, you need a good text and you need a good tune to go with it. A, a that is acceptable. Tune with 
kill a good that's text. Right. That's right. Absolutely uh, happens. We've seen yes. it. Yeah. Yes. We've seen it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't uh, help but remember uh, the arrangement you taught us when we were at Hartford of we'll understand it better by and by. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, you know, and that's just an example of, you know, mm -hmm. at, at, uh, at a hymn given new life, I guess that's it's for right. a new generation, yeah. you know, and well, still contempt, still just as effective and relevant. Yeah. You know, uh, Dr. Barr, I am, uh, I am challenged. I received an invitation today uh, by the hymn to write, uh, submit a peer-reviewed article about some research I'm currently doing in a publication that I put out called Seven uh, Hymns by Black Holiness Pentecostal Hymn Writers. And of course, they found that was very interesting. And one of the hymns by Robert C. Lawson was called His Name Shall Be Praised. And I remember hearing that hymn as a child in the congregation singing it. Now, when I found the score with that hymn written in that came out of the collection that was published by the denomination. And I looked at that hymn, that four part hymn, <laughs> one, two, three, four, one, tell me pray, his name tell me. And I said, oh Lord, the saints won't recognize it. Now they know that hymn and they'll say, we need to sing it. But they're going to, as Wendell Whalem used to say, they're gonna blacken it. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna season it with the culture and the people that know that hymn, and they're gonna sing every verse and they're gonna sing every refrain, but they're going to have their own kind of interpretation that has been shaped and molded by the group, and so they may say, "Well, that ain't the way you." They sing, they messing it up. Well, no, we're just not. What is represented on the paper does not represent the way it's actually performed. And that, uh, I think, sometimes has a lot to do with it. Uh, that hymn by Charles uh, Price Jones, I Will Make the Darkness Light, which is one of the most moving texts that I, uh, and of his hymn that, that, I, that I know. But it is just full of biblical and psalm references, almost every line. We went through it, and you could, you could immediately attach it to a, to a biblical reference. And many of these hymn writers were doing that. And so you can't say that it's not biblically based, it's not theologically sound, but I think that being relevant to the people who are singing them now is the challenge. There are some people that have succeeded. In fact, that Church of Christ Holiness USA just did a project last year uh, of kind of retuning some of Bishop Him, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Charles P. Jones hymns. And some of the older folk were saying, we don't even recognize it because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the text unfortunately got drowned in the new arrangements or in the retuning. And so that's a challenge. I, uh, I do know uh, Dr. Roland Carter and I were together uh, on a, um, at a workshop and he did an absolutely fabulous presentation of, con of starting with a spiritual and coupling it with a contemporary song or, or, or praise chorus or whatever, but it was, it started as the spiritual. And um, he did this with a Hall Johnson spiritual and then attached it with a young uh, gospel hymn writers refrain, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. You may have all this, but just give me Jesus. And he put these two, these together. And he had about three or four of those. I told him, please roll and publish those because uh, I heard uh, something, and I'm sure you probably heard it either, when Richard Smallwood wrote uh, his uh, piece, Healing. Uh, people thought, oh, wow, you know, that's so profound. A lot of folk did not get the language bomb in Gilead, B-A-L-M. They didn't know what that was. I, <laughs> I yes. jokingly tell this, but it was true. I had some students that uh, we were doing that right after 9-11 when I was teaching the show. One of the students came up to me very seriously and said, uh, uh, that was there like a bombing in Gilead at that time back in the Bible? Is that what this song is about? So it was time to teach, you know, it wasn't, you know, but I was glad that at least he asked, but he did not, in his ear, he heard B-O-M-B. -B. He did not hear B-A-L-M. And he just figured Gilead must have been somewhere in the Bible. So, you know, it just wasn't, you know, 9-11 in New York. But um, I think the same is true uh, of 
pulling that him healing with the spiritual there as a bond in Gilead so that people begin to see the relevance of these things. And I think that that becomes very, uh, people begin to get it. It opens up. There's so many very well-written contemporary gospel pieces. There's some pieces that I, uh, they, none come to mind right now that I would couple, let's say, with a spiritual or with something more traditional or hymns, but that's very popular. You know, that, what is it? How great is our God and how, how great thou art? You know, there, there are tons of those yes. examples. Yeah. I think those are just some of the ways we might experimenting experiment with making those kind of things more palatable to the congregation yeah. but as long as our congregations remain audiences while all this is going on in church we're in trouble because when people have not been taught to worship they must be entertained and those of us who lead in worship are really providing that entertainment and that's always very dangerous when people who have not been taught to worship or what the role of music is in worship invariably I know I deal with this in my local congregation. I've got a group of, of what I call Roman Colosseum uh, ticket holders who come every Sunday just waiting to see what the sacred uh, uh, gladiators are going to do, you know, and the thumb up or thumbs down, you know, there wasn't enough blood, it wasn't enough whatever. Many of these people are folks who, of course, tip God as opposed to tithe, uh, attend when it's regularly. Of course, now they're doing you know, uh, uh, computer side worship. And, uh, yes. but uh, they're still great critics of those folks who are still working hard and trying to make it happen and who are going against the odds to still keep yes. things going. Uh, none of us having been exempted from any of the pandemic uh, out there's many of us Absolutely. have fallen victims of that. But um, I think it's something that we're gonna have to really look at as we look at post pandemic worship, post pandemic programming in so many things, uh, but, uh, and I'm concerned about that con that whole idea of congregational song because what, what much of what we're doing now completely eliminates the congregation. And of course, you know how bad it's been with poor singers, can't even hardly sing now in churches, you know, and masks and, you know, well, that's, a, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's another talk. That's another. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, I, I just want to thank you again for this discussion and for, you know, all that you brought today. Um, I want to ask, and, and this may be an unfair question, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, uh, if you could, you know, in light of what we just discussed, uh, could you briefly place Charles Albert Tinley uh, on, the, on the, the wider scope of hymnology in terms of uh, how Okay, how has he influenced? How do you see him influencing now? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I think if we if we look at uh, what's available of his his hymns, and it's so it's so unbelievable just how little of his hymnody of this this volume of forty six, and I, I'm so glad I had it here to look at forty six. We literally have in print, well, in the United Methodist Assembly. Now, you know, ultimately, uh, he, it became United Methodist. Prior to that time, it was Methodist Episcopal. Episcopal. But in the current United Methodist hymnal that they have, of course, is quite dated because it goes back to 1989. There have been supplements since that time. But in terms of the official hymnal, five of his hymns uh, uh, exist. And I think I named them. Nothing between Leave It There, Stand By Me, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the enemies, the heavens, Christmas tree, a better day is coming. These have come lately out of co compilations that fortunately GIA publication has made possible. And of course there was uh, the, the general publishing board of the United Methodist Church did a supplement, Songs of Zion uh, in the late, uh, 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 oh, I can't remember his name, uh, who was at, in Washington, added a few more hymn, Tinley hymns that were there. But it's almost difficult to categorize him because he's so limited to the few hymns that he wrote. So other than, unfortunately, to say, well, we want to do a hymn by a Black composer, let's, let's do this. Or we have this liturgy that we want to put together and we want to just use the refrain of stand by me, stand by me, or that, you know, they're used kind of in 
a responsorial psalm type thing and it be, kind of becomes the antiphon or something that's used. Um, but I think as more people begin to know him as social activists, that's the part I think that people don't realize about him. And this, this, wonderful, this wonderful essay that was written one, exactly 100 years ago, January 1st, and see the kind of political activist and what he was doing in that city and how he was really dealing with the issues of that time. Uh, I'm not sure that songwriters would know how to write it, especially songwriters of color. Now, I must quickly say that there are some hymn writers who are non-African Americans who are writing some absolutely incredible hymnology. And that's why I have to put a plug in for the Hymn Society. If you go on that website, you will find some hymns. There are hymns about COVID. There are hymns that have been written that are, you know, just tons of justice hymns. Uh, you know, that was one of the things we looked at with the we shall uh with the uh one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We need new hymnies. We need writers. I have been in trying to encourage my students at, at Candler to become more uh, poets. You know, we're not trying to get them to write hymns because when they think of writing hymns, they're thinking about writing music. They don't understand that neither Charles Wesley, Isaac Watts, nor Fanny Crosby wrote one piece of music, but they wrote thousands of hymn texts and their text was set by other musicians. So that is important to know because there are people who are wonderful poets and many of their pieces. I just came across a wonderful hymn text that was written by Howard Thurman that was set to music by, our, uh, by uh, John W. Work. Had never seen it. I was just blown out of, out of, out of my mind. And there's, there's another, there's a, a wonderful text uh, by, uh, 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 a Christmas text by uh, Thurman that really is just begging for a wonderful, good uh, hymn uh, 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 music. I have served on committees that have looked at, you know, hymn competitions, and uh, there, are, there are various levels of talent out there for sure. Uh, but I wish that there were more folk who were even familiar with it. Um, in that second volume of readings in African American church music and worship, uh, S.T. Kimbrough, who was a part of this uh, project that we did, has an incredible uh, article in there called uh, uh, Charles Albert Tindle, Tindley, Lyrical Theology, a, theolo a lyrical theology of him, and talks about justice comes of age. And he really looks at all of these texts that we don't know about Tindley. And my God, I, I assign it in my classes. And when students look at it, they're like, wow, he wrote this, but these are not the hymns that made it into the to the popular canon. So people don't know them. Well, so thank you. it's hard to model what's not available. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we don't have time to even go into gender <laughs> issues. Oh, Lord, uh, oh, but... <laughs> Lord, yeah. yeah. But uh, yes, uh, that's that's a, a topic for another time. But thank you mm -hmm. so much uh, again, Dr. Abington, Jimmy, uh, for making yourself available and for this wonderful Absolutely. presentation. Thank you. Um, we look forward to having you in person. Oh, please! <laughs> we want you. I, we want you to come to the campus. I want to walk. Uh, the, I want to walk the grounds where where oh, William Dawson walked. You must. <laughs> you must. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.